here's the B-29, your super fortress. And those are its four right 3350 engines. This is the sound of 8,800 horsepower. Yes, 8,800 horsepower. That's what they'll give you if this man, this B-29 flight engineer, knows his job. The ground crew maintains the engines, keeps them in condition to deliver their tremendous power. But once in the air, it's up to the flight engineer to get that power from them. It is he who must be able to interpret these instruments and adjust these engine controls so that the pilot gets exactly the power he wants and gets it economically. But the flight engineer's job is more than just flying. It begins on the ground, right here, with the other members of the flight crew as they inspect their B-29 before a simulated operational flight. Each man has work to do before the airplane moves off the parking apron. For example, here's the top gunner preparing his twin 50s for action while the ground crew is servicing the airplane, topping off the gas tanks getting the fire extinguishers in place for engine starting. And here are the pilot and co-pilot completing their last check before takeoff. But this is the man we're interested in, the flight engineer. Last trip there was trouble with the waste gate on number three outboard turbo. Sure, it's been fixed. But just the same, the flight engineer is the one who's finally responsible. So he checks for himself. Yes, if you're part of a B-29 crew, you have to know your job. But that's not enough. You've got to know the other fellow's job, too. Not just theoretically, but well enough to substitute on no notice at all. Today, for example, the pilot has decided to check out Lieutenant Anderson, ordinarily the co-pilot, as a flight engineer. Yes, you, Lieutenant. You've been warned about this. Now let's see how well you've prepared yourself. First of all, Mr. Flight Engineer, better get started on the bookkeeping. Well, Flight Engineer for a day. That's me. It looks like I've got all the dope right here in this clipboard. Forms 1, 1A. Form F. The flight engineer's log. I guess they'll tell me everything I'll need to know. One thing you should pay particular attention to is the CG, center of gravity. It's 26% of the MAC, which is about right for this loading. Now they're ready to pull the engines through. No, let Anderson do it. He's flight engineer today, remember? Okay, now let's see. What's the first thing I do? Hmm. Well, if those engines are going to be pulled through, I'd better climb inside and take a look at the ignition switches. They're off. So it's okay for the men to go ahead in those engines. Oh, and while I'm here, I'd better check the dome and the governor pad. Sometimes they spring oil leaks. This one seems to be okay, but there are three more engines to take care of. After the last engine is pulled through, I, uh, well, what does come next? Oh, sure, sure, the putt-putt. Can't operate without that. The tail gunner is already going over the generator. Check the oil, of course, and then make sure the emergency switch is set at normal. That's right. Now it's ready to deliver those 200 amps whenever you need them. As long as I'm back here in this part of the ship anyway, might as well check the tool kits. There they are, underneath the top turret. The seals are unbroken, so that's all right. Everything else okay in here. Next, there's the cabin pressure regulators up in the gun control compartment. See that the lock is off. That means the regulator is in the automatic position. Got to check the lock on the other regulator, too. 
Now better take a look at the emergency cabin pressure release valve. This one has to be closed. And see there's no loose equipment near to clog it. Now that's about all there is to check back here. Oh, but one sure thing. I better take a look at the equipment in the bomb bay. Okay, portable emergency motor in flap operating position, right where it belongs. Turbo superchargers are next. Test hood for security. Take a look at the wastegate axle. Should have plenty of play and no ballooning in the nozzle box. This is the last of the turbos. It's okay too. Everything else seems to be in good shape. What's next? Oh yeah, fire extinguisher in the right place. All right, fall in for inspection. So get into your flying equipment, Anderson. Flight coveralls, parachute, gloves, boots, and don't forget your pistol and oxygen mask. The crew of a V-29 must be inspected before every flight, just like the airplane itself. The pilot's going to ask a lot of these men in the next dozen hours, so he makes sure that every man is physically able and properly equipped to perform his duties. And that means a careful, painstaking inspection, not just a quick check. Only when the pilot is satisfied that his crew will function at top efficiency, he orders them into the plane. That's right, Lieutenant. The B-29 is big, but it's still crowded inside. So carry in your flight equipment. You can put it all back on again later. As far as your new job, all you have to do is... Well, come on. What comes first? What's the matter with me? What have I got a checklist for? Uh-huh. Battery switch. Battery switch on. Next is master ignition switch. Hmm. Over there. Master ignition switch on. Oxygen equipment? That's right. Well, the mask looks okay. So, plug it in the regulator. Who left that auto mix off? That sure would waste oxygen. Pressure's 425, which is correct. And the emergency valve works. The blinker stays open. So that's that. Now, how about the portable oxygen bottle? Well, it's full. Pressure's 400. The voltage regulator vent valves, they're next. One set of regulators is alongside the navigator's cabinet. The valve handle ought to be up on this installation. The other set is directly behind the engineer's panel at the radio operator's left. This handle is also up, just as it should be. Okay, Lieutenant, that's taken care of. Now go on from there. Wait and see G. Emergency motor. Okay, okay. Cabin pressure relief valve. Turned all the way to high pressure position. Right. Better plug into the interphone circuit. Headset jack. No. No, it goes in the other socket. Okay. Now the mic into this one. The co-pilot wants you to get the putt-putt going. So you use the interphone to call the tail gunner and tell him to start the power plant. Here's the proper starting procedure. Turn on the ignition switch and hold the generator switch in the start position. Move the control lever over to run. And after the putt-putt warms up for two or three minutes, snap the generator switch to the run position. Then snap the equalizer switch on. Putt-putt running, so I'd better check the voltage. Selector switch set. Voltage 28. And now what's on the checklist? Well, there's current available so I can try out my heated flying suit. Have to turn the rheostat off before plugging in. Now to get connected up. Just slip this one jack into the socket, then twist the rheostat all the way to maximum. 
I should begin to cook pretty soon. While I'm waiting for the suit to warm up, I might as well check the fluorescent lights. Turn it on, twist the lens, and there you are. Two more of them over on the left. Turn the switches on and look at the bulbs. All okay. The co-pilot has the correct barometric pressure, so you can set your altimeters. Don't forget you've got two of them. Outside pressure, zero, zero, one. And cabin pressure the same, zero, zero, one. And you'd better check the clock on the panel with Lieutenant Floyd's chronometer watch. And now I can test the controls. Only maybe first that mixture lock should come off. Mixture controls move easily enough. And these throttles seem to be all right, too. One, two, three, and four. Okay. Vacuum pump selector valve and the emergency cabin air valves. All moving free and easy. Gosh, it's hot in here. Well, why don't you turn your rear stat off? And next, next comes the hydraulic system. Gauges should read around 1,000, but there's only 200 pounds on the normal pressure gauge. Now to fix that, I push the hydraulic pump switch to emergency and hold it there until the pressure comes up to about 400. Then release the switch. It'll go back to auto. Open the hydraulic shutoff valve, and the pressure on each gauge should rise to 1,000. It did. So put the hydraulic pump switch on emergency again and see if the pressure climbs above 1,000. That shows the pump will charge both systems. Shut off valve back to close. And then what's next? Never mind. Never mind, I know. Parking brakes on, wheels chocked fore and aft. How about it, Captain? The pilot has taken care of the parking brake, and he can look at the chocks on the left landing gear. Those on the right are checked by the co-pilot. Form 1A shows how much gas and oil we have, so I check the figures with the gauge readings. All the tanks are full, and not much difference between the actual load and the gauge readings either. Now, where's that checklist? Auto sin inverter switch. Oh, there it is. 26 volts. One inverter's okay. Have to give it a chance to stop running before I try the other. 26 volts again. So, it's all right, too. Cowl flaps. Oil cooler flaps. Intercooler flaps. Well, the cowl flaps are first. The switches are spring-loaded. Have to hold them in the open position until the indicator is up to the last line. Wide open. Take a look outside at them to make sure. Yeah, they're open. Oil cooler shutters are next. Put each one of them in the auto position. Then the intercooler flaps. Push them to the open position and Hold it until the pointers on the indicators are clear over, all the way open. Turbo off, props in high RPM, the pilot's telling you. All right, open those fuel shutoff valves. That guard is to keep you from accidentally closing them. Now turn on the cabin pressure warning switch and you're ready for engine starting. All right, let's get set. Fire extinguisher selector on number one engine. Crack the number one mixture control and set the fuel booster rheostat to give about 16 pounds fuel pressure. Then close the mixture control. That knocks out your fuel pressure for now, but it'll come right back to the correct value when the engine's going, since the rheostat's all set. 
Not more than 30 minutes since the engines were pulled through. That's okay. Start one. That's right. Crack the number one throttle. Thousand RPM position's about right. And now you're set. Only let's just take a minute to see exactly what switches you're going to use. First, the starter switches. And then, right alongside them, the primer switches. And here's what you do. Pull the number one starter switch at accelerate for 15 to 30 seconds. And while you're doing it, watch the load on the putt-putt ammeter. Then turn the starter switch to start. After the propeller has made two revolutions, turn the magneto switch to both. And prime. When the engine fires, move the mixture control to auto rich. Then release the starter switch at once, but continue to prime intermittently until the engine is running smoothly. relax so quickly. You're not half through yet. What about nose oil pressure? You're in trouble if that doesn't hit 30 to 50 pounds within 30 seconds. Rear oil pressure must be 60 to 80 pounds. And fuel pressure has to stay between 15 and 18 pounds. Okay. Guess I'm ready for engine number two. All right. I wasn't going to forget the extinguisher. Now you ought to be an old hand at starting engines. So let's see how smoothly you can do it. Fire extinguisher. Accelerate 15 to 30 seconds. Then snap it to start. After two revolutions, magneto switch to both and prime. At 800 RPM, mixture controls to auto rich. You needn't look so surprised. That's a new engine they just put in there. Maybe it's a little bit cranky. So turn off your magneto switch and start over again. forgot to move number four mixture control back to idle cutoff. Take a look at that gurgle tube out there. Now you'll have to blow all that excess gasoline out of the engine. Set the mixture control and switch off the ignition. Then open the throttle wide and turn the engine over twice with the starters alone. Now you can go ahead and start number four. But first give that starter a few seconds to cool off. That's done it. Now let's have another look at that checklist. Oh, just one more thing. Turn on the cabin air conditioning switches. And I can tell the pilot we're ready to taxi. Hey, not so fast, Lieutenant. You still have to check cylinder head temperature. Oil pressure. And fuel pressure. All normal. So the pilot orders the generators on. Then he tells the bombardier to close the bomb bay doors. He pulls the switch, and you and the gunners check to make sure the doors do close. Then it's stand by to taxi.
plane reaches the runway, the engines must be checked. Now you can get set for takeoff. First, the pilot increases all throttles to 1500 RPM. And checks the props to full decrease. Then to full increase. While he's doing that, check all the generators. Output voltage and amperage OK. So turn the generators off. Now that props and generators check out, the pilot pulls the throttles back to 700 RPM and tells you to check the magnetos. Advance number one throttle to 2000 RPM. Magneto switch to right. RPM should drop a little. Anything less than 100 is okay. Then back to both and try the left magneto. 50 RPM drop again. That's all right. Back to both and return the number one throttle to 700 RPM. Go through the same procedure on all the other engines, one at a time. Okay, so check all instruments for proper reading. Now let's have a look at that checklist. Sure, sure, oil pressure, nose and rear, fuel pressure, oil temperature, cylinder head temperature, all normal. Hmm. Guess I'm ready to take off. The pilot is ready too. He releases the parking brake and adjusts the engines for full military power. Turbo is at position eight and starts opening the throttles. And here's where you really get busy. Start the cowl flaps closing. Turn on the fuel booster pumps. Switch on each of the six generators as soon as you're up to 1400 RPM. Since no power check has been made, the co-pilot and engineer keep a close watch on RPM and manifold pressure during the first third of takeoff. Normal reading, you'd have to call the pilot to cut off engines. Looks fine. And those cowl flaps, you have to keep them open as long as possible. Yet they must be down around seven and a half degrees before you leave the ground. That's not easy. And above everything, keep watching your cylinder head temperature and oil pressure. The pilot makes sure to put the wheel brakes on before the gears are retracted. As soon as you've got safe flying speed, you can open the cowl flaps as much as 10 degrees. But don't do it unless the cylinder heads are getting hot. And now the pilot can reduce power. He's still climbing, so he sets up condition two. Once the gear and wing flaps are reported up, call the tail gunner to stop the putt-putt. Right, and I can turn off the fuel booster pumps. Only make sure there's no drop in fuel pressure. And there isn't. Everything's okay. Mm-hmm. Guess we cruise here. 10,000 feet. Yes, the pilot has leveled off and is now setting up cruising conditions. 2100 RPM and 31 inches manifold pressure. That's cruising power. You can see it yourself. Now I get busy. Turbos are off, so intercooler flaps ought to be closed. Then the mixture controls to auto lean. Tell the pilot and do it. 
Easy does it with those controls. Jiggle them a bit until they snap into the detent position. And then lock them. Now cylinder head temperature. So I can close the cow flaps a bit without raising the head temperatures. Wait a minute. This is no time for the flight engineer to rest. You've got to keep your eye on those gauges every minute. So let's check again just what you have to watch. Nose oil pressure, 30 to 50 pounds. Rear oil pressure, 60 to 70 pounds. Fuel pressure, 15 to 18 pounds. Cylinder head temperatures, not more than the maximum limit. And oil temperature, under 91. Okay. Okay. What does the checklist say? Uh-huh. Look at the generators every 30 minutes. Output voltage not to exceed 28. And the ammeter should kick over about the same amount for each generator. They're charging evenly, all right. That's the six of them. All okay. And another thing you have to do is fill out the engineer's log. You must record percentage of power used, air speed, rate of climb, free air temperature, pressure altitude, cowl flap setting. Every 30 minutes, you must do that. But most important of all is fuel consumption. So now after nearly 10 hours of flight, you know where you stand. The wing tanks are about half empty. The gauges show that plainly enough. There's plenty of gas in the bomb bay tanks, though. So let's get it out to the wing tanks where it will be some use. Hmm. All right. One fuel transfer valve at rear bomb bay position. Other at the number four wing tank position. Then turn on the fuel transfer switches. Pulling these two toward me makes the pump transfer from right to left. Then I just watch the gauge. When the needle shows that number four is full, turn the switches off. That ought to do it. That's fine. But look what the pilot has to do to keep that wing up. And that's a dangerous condition. So now, move the right fuel transfer valve to the number one wing tank position. And push the switches forward this time. That will pump gasoline out of number four into number one. When the tanks are evened up, each one about three quarters full, the airplane will be balanced again. Then you turn all the switches off. Naturally, tanks two and three would be filled the same way. What's the matter? Oh, something wrong with the number four engine. Seems to be running a little rough. But don't feather it, as long as there's no other indication of trouble. Better keep your eye on those instruments. your flight is almost over. The pilot gives the order, prepare to land. I think I'll get rid of these heavy gloves. You've got plenty to do. Hey, uh, first, tell the tail gunner to start the putt button. Then shift the mixture controls to auto rich. We're coming into the downwind leg of the landing pattern now. I've got a job ahead of me. Yes, Lieutenant, you have a job ahead of you. 
a precision chop, because you must coordinate what you do with the pilot's procedure. All right. First thing, give the pilot the gross weight and new CG. Then the airplane enters the traffic pattern at an indicated airspeed of 180 miles per hour, 1,500 feet altitude. On the downwind leg, the co-pilot lowers the landing gear. The engineer checks the output voltage and amperage on all six generators and turns on the fuel booster pumps. The pilot turns the turbo boost control all the way up to position eight. It sets the props to 2400 RPM. Since turbos are now on, the engineer must open the intercooler flaps, check hydraulic pressure, and set the cowl flaps to keep cylinder head temperatures between 150 and 160 degrees. The co-pilot lowers the wing flaps 25 degrees. And you keep your eye on cylinder head temperature. Just before lowering the wing flaps all the way, airspeed should be between 150 and 160, altitude 1000. After the flaps are down, airspeed should be 30 miles per hour above stalling speed. Check hydraulic pressure again. You'll need it soon. And keep watching cylinder head temperature and oil pressure. And now you're almost on the ground. The B-29 lands at 90 to 110 miles an hour. As soon as the plane is down, start the cowl flaps opening. When the wing flaps are up, turn the generators off. Next, fuel booster pumps off. And now the cowl flaps should be wide open. Then a final check of hydraulic pressure. And last, the pilot turns the turbos off and sets the props to full increased position. You're down now, and that's the end of the flight. And a tough one, too. Can't say I'm sorry to get out of this seat. Not quite so fast, Lieutenant. You're not through yet. The engines are still running. You started them. You stopped Throttle back to 700 RPM. After head temperatures have dropped to 190, make a complete mag test. Open the bomb bay doors, then... Then mixture controls to idle cutoff. When the engines have stopped, open all throttles wide. Order the auxiliary power plant stopped. Then turn off all the switches. Magnetos. Master ignition, battery, and inverter switch. Check the parking brake. It shouldn't be set until the brake drums are cool. And after you've made sure that the wheels are chocked fore and aft, you're ready for inspection. Yes, there's an after-flight inspection, too. Well, Lieutenant, now you've got an idea of what the flight engineer has to do. At least what he has to do during the flight. Remember how that number four tachometer needle was fluctuating? There wasn't anything that you could do about it while you were flying, but it meant a lot to Lieutenant Floyd. It meant that new engine was running rough. So now he's going to see that it's fixed. He'll talk it over with the crew chief, and together they will track down the trouble. Yes, they'll both work on it. The engineer could just tell the crew chief what's wrong and forget about it until the next flight, but not if he's a good engineer. Those four engines are his responsibility. The only way he can be sure they're properly maintained is to check for himself. This trouble may take a long time to fix. Eight hours isn't too much to allow for changing a magneto. But he'll keep at the job until it's finished. That's the kind of thing an engineer is expected to do.